The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. We'll move on to our next speaker. He has an e easier name to pronounce, Ron Kozakowski. <laughs> He's with North Star Concrete Consulting, and I'll turn over to Ron. Yeah. Uh, I get to work a lot with contractors in the field, and uh, this study was a long time coming for us. Uh, we, it's focused on cold surfaces and cold rebar in contact with fresh concrete. And a lot of questions come up in the wintertime as to do we need to heat the formwork, do we need to heat the rebar, will it freeze the concrete? And it's a sustainability question that costs a lot of money, and obviously, a lot of the questions that come up are, if we place our own cold rebar, will it freeze the concrete? Uh, does ice form on the steel that you know could affect bond, potentially? Uh, could the cold steel affect setting time if it takes a while for the equilibrium temperature to occur throughout the concrete? So you place the concrete in contact, warm, con con excuse me, warm concrete in contact with cold steel. What is the equilibrium temperature like? Does it significantly drop the equilibrium temperature when they both come to equilibrium? Um, as far as heating the steel, and is it efficient? Sometimes we run into, on job sites, let's say we wanted to place concrete on a Friday, and so we start heating up the formwork and the rebar on a Tuesday or Wednesday, and then on Friday all of a sudden it's bad weather or something changes, and the pour is delayed till Monday. So, you know, do we stop heating? We just continue to heat the formwork uh, through, throughout the weekend. So obviously you can see how costs could escalate pretty quickly. So what we're looking at here is, just strategies as far as uh, will we need to heat the rebar and what if we actually measure it. Some thermal considerations, just generically, if we look at concrete, we have a really large thermal mass, so 90 to 95 to 99% of the, the form, whatever's in the form, is concrete, and um, steel is a minimal portion of what's in the forms. You might have 1% steel in a slab, you might have up to 5% steel in a column, but the good thing about steel is it's very, very conductive. So if, you, if it's in warm concrete, it's going to suck up that heat very quickly, and it, shouldn't, uh, de it, sh it should heat up pretty quickly. Uh, if we look at the heat balance of cal calculations, there's ways to calculate if we take cold steel and warm concrete, and we know the, f the physical properties of both of them, we can figure out what the equilibrium temperature should be. And just based on experience, um, the calculations in, in real world temperatures really only decrease about a few degrees when we place uh, cold steel in contact with warm concrete. The trouble with calculations is that we don't really see what the kinetics are. We know that the balance in the equilibrium temperature may only drop a couple of degrees, but we don't know how fast it gets there. <clears throat> as far as cold surfaces, there's two main criteria in ACI 306. One is when we place concrete in, in contact with a surface, whether it's formwork or steel or the ground, uh, we need to be aware of what ACI requires. And actually, looking through ACI, there's, there's differences on what different documents require. ACI 306, uh, the guide is different from uh, ACI 301, 10, and even the specification on cold weather concrete, there's some slight differences as well. So we, we're trying to take a look at that. Um, identifying massive concrete metallic embedments. So another concern in the wintertime is if we have a steel section coming up through the floor or even uh, cold weather, 306 defines a massive metallic embedment, anything above a number nine bar. So if we have something bigger than that, do we need to heat it? Will massive embedments uh, freeze the concrete? Uh, so as far as cold weather surface recommendations, we can see the differences. ACI 306, the specification on Coelho concrete, it says you can actually use the concrete to warm up the steel, and then once it's warm, you uh, just have to protect it so you maintain the required temperature. ACI 30110 
is a little more strict. It tells you that all surfaces in contact with concrete have to be at least 35 degrees. So that means, in general, we're going to have to heat up the rebar, heat up the formwork. And then 30610, there's a requirement there where I think it's meant more for slabs on ground where we don't want uh, the surface to influence the setting time. So in that one, I, it's listed with, it could potentially be confused with columns and walls, but that's something we'll talk about as well. Massive, excuse me, massive metallic amendments, as I mentioned, it's just large sections that could potentially freeze concrete. But we wanted to look at what would be considered a massive metallic embedment and what could potentially cause an issue. So our research project, the basic questions uh, that we wanted to look at were, do actual measurements match finite element analysis models? Is heating to 32 degrees necessary? Do we have to heat the concrete, or can we use the warmth of the concrete to actually heat up cold reinforcing steel? And the variables we looked at were uh, rebar sizes from number 3 to number 18. We looked at concrete temperature of about 55 degrees and steel temperatures of negative 5. So we tried to use something that was really, really cold. Uh, steel volumes, we tried to change the concentration. Like I mentioned, a slab might have 1% steel uh, or a wall. A column might have something up to a 5% steel volume. So you can see the sizes of the steel we used. We used number 3 through number 18, and you can see a number 3 is drastically different from a number 18. And uh, currently the number 9, the fourth one from the left, is what's classified as a massive embedment. In our study, we took a look at, uh, with the bars, each bar that we tested, we instrumented with uh, therm uh, thermistors and we placed one at the center of the bar and we attached one to the surface of the bar to look to see um, if ice could form on the surface. So we used actually a piece of fishing line, we tried to tie it tight. We didn't use epoxy, we went through a couple of iterations, we actually did use epoxy. We found that that, that buffered the temperatures and we wanted to get quick changes in temperatures. So thermistors are what we found to work the best. The mold dimensions, if you look at the top line, table one is a 5% steel concentration, table two is a 1% steel concentration. And if you look at the rebar size on the top line versus the mold volume on the bottom, you can see the, the big differences. So for a number 18 bar at 5%, the volume of the mold was basically a half a cubic foot. When we go to a number 18 at 1%, the volume was two and, two and three quarter cubic feet, so very large molds. These are the molds we use in the study. Uh, the back row is the 1% molds, the front row is the 5%. We insulated the molds to try to keep what was happening on the inside uh, just so we could tell there wasn't any, any external influences. Uh, the, so they were insulated with one inch polystyrene insulation. Uh, we drilled a hole through the center of the tops just to help center the bar in the middle. Let's picture inside the molds. This is the setup inside the mold. What we wanted to do was get a distribution of temperature throughout the block itself. So we have a thermistor inside the bar, we have a thermistor on the bar, and then the vertical lines you can see from the bar outward is a one quarter diameter, one half diameter, one diameter, and two diameters. And the reason we chose the diameter spacing is that because we're looking at a lot of different sizes. So a number three varies tremendously from a number 18, and to have consistency, we based our spacing on diameters so we could tell um, the relative distribution no matter what size we looked at. And this is the kind of information we we're basically looking for. Whenever you freeze water, you're always going to get a plateau. It's going to get down to 32 or freezing, and then as the water freezes, it's going to stay at 32 as the ice forms. Once ice stops forming and it's solid ice, it's going to act as a solid and it's going to cool. So to start the study, we just tried to get a relative idea of what uh, different materials would do. We use water paste, mortar, and concrete, and we use the same volume of material for each uh, test. And you can see with water, pure water, there was just plenty of it available, so it took a lot longer for it to get through the freezing stage and actually freeze below 32. Uh, when we looked at paste, mortar, and concrete, you can see that 
basically the, the less and less water you have, the less it plateaus. But in every case, even in the concrete, we got a freezing plateau. So once you freeze it below 32 or below freezing, you're going to get some type of plateau to prove that there's freezing. <coughs> um, now this would help if we look back at the distribution of the thermistors. So we've got the, the bar, one diameter, I'm sorry, quarter, half, one, and two. And the way this figure works <coughs> is that we have the black line represents the temperature in the bar, the blue line represents the temperature on the surface of the bar, and then the green is a quarter diameter away, blue is a half a diameter away, one and two diameters. So you can see the temperature distribution throughout the concrete. I've shown a number 18 bar here because this is really the most drastic case. And what we see is basically it heats up relatively quickly and it comes to equilibrium within a couple of hours. So this is our worst case scenario. If we zoom in on it a little bit, we can get a better idea of what's going on. So one of the most important findings is that within about five or six minutes, the bar, the center of the bar itself was above freezing. So it didn't take very long for a cold bar at negative five degrees placed in 55 degree concrete to actually get above freezing. And the blue line at the surface of the bar shows we don't get a plateau. It's no flat line. It, it, the slope gradually increases, but it's not a flat line. So we don't see any freezing on even a number 18 bar. This is a 5% number 18. And uh, one of the most interesting things here, too, is that uh, with 5%, the higher steel concentration really didn't change how fast the bar got above freezing. What it did was it showed that you come to equilibrium just quicker. So uh, with a number 18 at 1% steel, there we go. Uh, at a number 18 bar at 1% steel, equilibrium occurs after about, uh, I don't know, almost three hours, 100 minutes, 200 minutes. I'm sorry, 180, 200 minutes. And then with uh, 18 at 5 percent, equilibrium occurs about 80 minutes, so about half the time. This is an example of something on the opposite end, a number 5 bar. You can see that it comes to equilibrium very, very rapidly. And if we zoom in on it, it gets above 32 almost instantaneously, and it comes to equilibrium within about 9 minutes. So a summary of all the data. The first column shows the, the top table is 1% steel, the bottom table is 5% steel. And you can see the starting temperatures. We tried to hold them as close to negative 5 degrees as possible, and we tried to hold the concrete to about 55. Um, but I think one of the most interesting findings is the fourth column where it talks about time for the bar surface to heat to 32. Uh, for anything that was considered a massive metallic embedment under the current cold weather specifications, a number nine bar heats up <coughs> above 32 in about a minute, and even the number 18 within five minutes. Um, we also looked at theoretical calculation of heat uh, equilibrium versus the measured. So we can see we got a starting temperature of the concrete at 58, and uh, the bar measured equilibrium is 56.6. When we ran the calculation, the actual equilibrium calculated was 57. So 57 versus 56.6, we were very close. <clears throat> so the conclusions from our study, we found out there was no temperature plateaus that we could see in, in the, the graphs, which indicated there was no freezing. Um, rebar surfaces warmed up above 32 very rapidly. The measured equilibrium values match the calculated values very closely. I discussed we did the, the measured versus calculated equilibrium temperatures, and they were very, very good. Uh, the increased steel concentration from 1 to 5 percent, it didn't really affect the time that it took to heat the bar up to 5 degrees, but the, it came, they came, the 5 percent came to equilibrium much, much sooner. So our recommendations as far as cold surfaces go, right now ACI, 30110 says that the concrete surface, con surfaces in contact with concrete should be at least 35. Uh, 306 also recommends 32. What we recommend is that 
This shows there's no freezing on the bars even when you have a negative 5 degree bar with 50 degree concrete. So we would just conservatively say if you could place concrete at 10 degrees, you wouldn't have to heat the formwork, you wouldn't have to heat the steel. The thermal mass of the concrete and the conductivity of the bar would do its job and actually warm it up itself. So it's a more sustainable option. We may waste a lot of energy and heat heating up bars when the concrete would do the job for us. And as far as cold massive metallic embedments, when we looked at a number 18 bar, we still didn't see any freezing on the surface of the bar. And 306 has reference to a study by Supernaut and Basham that showed uh, a number 9 bar is considered a massive, anything above a number 9 is considered a massive metallic embedment. And uh, talking to Bruce and Kim, what I found out there is that they didn't test anything higher than a number 9 bar. They didn't do any calculations, so they just considered, or they said, we can't evaluate if something bigger than number 9 could actually be a massive metallic embedment. Our research shows that an, a number 18 bar measured still doesn't freeze, so we would recommend moving the requirement from a massive metallic embedment from anything greater than a number 9 to anything greater than a number 18, which is about uh, 4 inches in cross-section. So. All right, we do have time for some questions, so fire away. Yeah, is this published this day? That's a good question. It's actually going to be published in Concrete International uh, in April. There's there's a lot of information here. I, I really breezed through it, but the article will discuss it in much more detail, better detail. Uh, the April, it's actually two versions, two, two articles. The April article will talk about the research study, and then there's an article coming out in May that will talk about the strategic impl implications, so uh, what, what changes we would recommend to 306. Anything else? Thanks so much.